Welcome to Chapter 7, Information Technology in Business. After reviewing the PowerPoint, you should be comfortable in explaining information technology's role in business, understanding how information is managed, describing various types of hardware and software, as well as discussing challenges in information technology. The first thing we're going to talk about is the role of IT in business, information technology in business. One of the first things to recognize is the nature of information technology itself, and that is change is the only constant. And it's very important to remember how much technology has changed over my lifetime, your lifetime, you know, going back the last 20, 40 years. Changes occur rapidly, and businesses must be aware so they can use new technology that may help their business. This all goes back to the same thing dealing with production operations management. You're looking at ways to improve what you're doing, improve the productivity, improve the efficiency. And technology helps to change business. Consider communications alone. How much has this changed business? How much has communication technology changed in the last 20 years alone? You know, the way customers interact through technology has also changed business. You now have it where customers are finding it a lot easier to contact and reach out to businesses through social media, through email, um, through blogs, through different ways. And businesses need to use technology to share info and manage information. Many business owners are reluctant to use new technology. When this occurs, they will likely be at a disadvantage to other companies who can use it to save money and communicate better. It's one of the things that social media gives uh, a small business an equal footing you know, competitive wise with a large business. You know, a small business, if they have the knowledge and if they have the know-how to do it, to use it, social media is a great tool that will provide a level playing ground. It's also important to keep in mind the history of information technology. We're not going to get into a whole lot of the history simply, but simply keep in mind that going back to like the 1970s, data processing was key. Data wasn't, u wasn't very useful because it was raw and unanalyzed. You know, go back to you know, the card catalog and a library back before we had computers to search for books. You went to the card catalog and you would find information. Same thing with businesses. When I first entered into the business that, that I have, and it's been over 20 years, you know, the first database I had was a filing cabinet filled with 3x5 cards. You know, in the 1980s, you know, changed the use of, um, changed the use of information so that it was information rather than data. It was organized and it was usable. Customers got used to a lot more technology such as ATMs and fax machines. However, data was still not very user friendly because it was still raw, it was still unanalyzed when it came to you know, larger, what we consider now to be big data. In the 1990s, information technology changed again and um, changed business immensely during this time period. There's less of a focus on the technology itself and more on how it could actually be used. IT changes in business is the next part we're going to talk about. You know, for example, there's time and place, there's location changes. Now there are other changes. So for example, time and place. Time and place change with technology. Customers get access to info such as banking information at their own convenience. It wasn't a case where you had to go to the bank during banking hours during that 9 to 4, 9 to 5 period in order to get the information you needed. You could access it from your house, you know, right from your laptop, your smartphone, right from your computer. It also changed location. You know, we're not, we're no longer interdependent on of location because of technology. For example, a fashion designer in Seattle can communicate quite easily with manufacturers in China. People can work at home and have meetings online rather than traveling to the meetings. For example, during the winter, a friend of mine is in IT, and because of the weather, he couldn't travel from his house 
to the hour-long drive, hour-long commute into work because of the snow. So he was able to take care of what he needed to at his house through the use of technology. Now, for example, that's an example of telecommuting. And one of the biggest advances or advantages to technology is this interdependence of place. You know, it's utilizing the internet, which allows us, you know, the freedom in some jobs that we haven't had before. You know, some companies, in their efforts to be green, are allowing employees to work at home more and more often, saving fuel, keeping cars off the road. You know, it's a great way to reduce emissions. You know, and some studies have found that employees are actually more productive when they work at home. One of the tips to making it work is to have an agreement between the employee and the supervisor. You know, if it's important, always get it in writing. There's also e-business and e-commerce. E-business is any type of business done on the web, whereas e-commerce is actually making transactions happen online. E-business is the umbrella word for anything a business does on the web. You know. There's also Web 2.0, and that's a term given to the idea that people can build social and business connections through applications such as Facebook or Twitter. You know, but it's the information, the management information. One of the biggest concerns is, is the information useful or is it not useful? You know, we must know what information is going to help us and what information isn't going to help us. You know, we have to look at areas such as quality, completeness, completeness, timeliness, and relevance. Quality is where we consider that data must be reliable and accurate in order for it to be able to be usable to make business decisions. Completeness is where a business person must have enough data in order to make decisions. Timeliness is when the data needs to be available at the right time in order for making useful decisions. There's also relevance, and that's where the data must apply to the decision being made. So we need to know all these four characteristics, all these four qualities, if the information is useful or if it's not useful. And that brings us to the next part of managing information, and that's data warehouses. Data warehouses is where data is stored and you're able to sort data on a specific subject over a period of time. For example, libraries use data warehouses. Walmart uses data warehouses to keep track of all their data from the transactions. NSA was popular in the media a couple of years ago for their spying they were doing. And they use a data warehouse to keep track of all their data. And what it does is it makes the data easy to retrieve and to accomplish the goals you need to accomplish. Now here's one picture of the 2013 aerial photo of the NSA warehouse in Utah. To give an idea, it's a 1.5 million square foot facility and has an estimated yottabyte of data which comes out to a trillion terabytes. That's technology that did not exist before 2010. So in 2013, here's the data. Here's this information. Here's how fast it's, it's become. To give an example, Walmart in 2010 had the largest retailer data warehouse. It used an estimated 2,560 terabytes that's compared to the NSA facility, one trillion te um, terabytes. In 2013, the entire World Wide Web was estimated to contain one billion terabytes. So again, we're looking at NSA and exactly what is the concept of big data. And the reason that you have to have these data warehouses is because of data mining. And that's the process of designing a system so data is easy to find and retrieve. You know, can we discover relationships between data? When you're looking at customer data, for example, Walmart, you know, they need to find out, you know, what sort of information can we correlate on a given customer or a given area that can tell us and help us improve our sales. 
can we discover some sort of relationship that's intermingled with the data? When you purchase something from Amazon, you know, it suggests other items you might like. It's data mining. This can cause, though, the idea of infoglut. Infoglut is when you have so much information. You know, for example, if you do a Google search, you know, you can come up with millions upon millions of results. You know, it's an overload of information and you have to identify what information is useful, what information is not useful. And that brings us to the next section of hardware. You know, what is it? Hardware, all those items, the physical items such as um, wireless information appliances. But before we get into that, it's important to understand Moore's Law. You know, the chairman of Intel predicted that data chips would double every year. Of course, he was just a little bit off. They've exceeded this by thousands. You know, it's even gotten to the point where wireless information appliances, that's the newest trend in data. For example, you can have refrigerators have been on the market that they are, you're able to surf the web, you're able to have data management of the contents of the refrigerator. You're able to talk to and communicate with the refrigerator through your cell phone. Now consider all the applications that can be downloaded to a phone, for example. What other type of appliances? You know, for example, you know, a wireless you know, security system, wireless routers, cell phones. You can surf the internet using phones. Now that's something that wasn't available 30 years ago. What other sorts of appliances are available? Then there's also the idea of an intranet. An intranet is a company-wide network you know, that is close to the public and you can store data such as pay history on a company or the company manual. You know, it's a tool for employees to keep in touch and a place for information to be posted. Now let's take a look at you know, other issues such as extranets. An extranet is a semi-private network where it might also be an intranet, but also open to selected groups such as suppliers. Then there's virtual private networks or VPNs also known as the bane of my existence. They are a private data network that uses the same internet lines but creates secure tunnels among regular internet lines. What about software though? You know, what are the various types of software that are available? Well you have writing software such as Microsoft Word. You have calculating or manipulating numbers such as MS Excel. You have database technology, you know, such as filing, so to allow you to file and retrieve data. That could be anything from MS Access to the SQL databases to some of the more popular, some of the bigger databases. You also have presentation um, software, such as Microsoft PowerPoint would be an example here. And that's where you can present information visually. There are also online um, software programs where you can create videos, you can create movies, you can create animation. There are different types of presentation software. There's also communication software, such as Microsoft Office, um, email, other tools um, for email or instant messenger. You know, that allows us to do things such as teleworking. But it also brings up other issues such as email etiquette. You know, where while it may seem that email etiquette doesn't matter, it turns out that 80% of the workforce has been frustrated at one time or another due to a lack of etiquette. Now, what could this translate to? Perhaps a lost promotion or even a lost job. Since much of the communication is done through email, oftentimes it can be the first impression or even the only impression someone has of you. Now, a couple of things that pop out to me as far as with um, email etiquette. Don't hit reply to all unless it's necessary for everyone on the list 
um, to see your response. Far too often with organizations, somebody sends out a group email and instead of replying directly to that person, they will reply to everyone. And it just clogs up the systems and it's very annoying to have 50, 60, 70 messages that day that have nothing whatsoever to do with anything I'm concerned with. It's also important to keep emails short. If it's longer than a paragraph, it's probably best to speak with the person. You know, and then descriptive subject lines. Too many times I see people, they send out an email and it has a subject that has nothing whatsoever, if it has a subject, but nothing whatsoever to do with the email. And we're going to talk about this in class. There's also accounting programs such as Quicken, um, MS Money, they'd be some examples. There's also web browsers such as Firefox, Google Chrome. Of course, lately in the news, Internet Explorer has said they're going to take Internet Explorer, uh, Microsoft said they're going to take Internet Explorer off the market. And all of these software, all these types of software, as long as security software, you know, they're meant to improve the processes that we do, improve what we have to do in our jobs in order to do them better, in order to improve our efficiency. And there's job specific, such as human resource management programs. Um, there's a link in the video um, from Mark Cuban about a video he says about stop making the mistake on social media. Now, if the link doesn't work, copy and paste the URL that's available into your address bar. And basically it gets into some of the processes that organizations are using in order to help screen out unwanted or less desired employees. There's also ideas such as project management, job or task specific, you know, such as this video on creating a Gantt chart. You know, it's, the video is used in Excel, but there are other project management apps that are available as well. Next step is IT challenges. You know, some of the IT challenges that come with, you know, having all of this great access technology is hackers. You know, our dependence on IT creates special challenges, such as hackers trying to break into computers or steal information. It seems every month in the news there's another system or another database that has been hacked into, whether it's a health insurance company, whether it's a government agency, whether it's a bank or a retail store. Yet it's something that consumers are very concerned with when it comes to the protection of their rights, protection of their privacy. There's also the idea of viruses, which can cost thousands of dollars of damage and lost productivity. They can even shut down a business for a period of time until they can get the problems figured out. There's also information security. You know, much of our government uses technology. The threat of cyber terrorism is a great concern. What if a hacker broke into a government computer with classified information? Obviously, that's, of course, never happened before and never been a subject of a very global news story. You know, privacy issues. You know, it used to be that we were concerned with the use of cookies, you know, and people tracking us online. You know, consumers are becoming more and more worried about their private information being stored and stolen by hackers. And the responsibility of business is they are expected to take great measures to make sure it doesn't happen. And if it does, they lose the trust and credibility that their stakeholders had with them. There's also issues with phishing. You know, many scams start with phishing, an email that looks like a regular email from a business, but then steals private information and allows for identity theft or information theft. There's also the challenge of stability. Since we're so dependent on technology, having a stable access to technology for business is important. Reliability. Reliability creates a very important issue in itself. You know, we have to take a look at accuracy. How accurate is the data that we're using as a business? 
You know, who's writing the data? Do they have the authority to speak on the topic? Does the information cover both sides of the issue? Or does it lean one way or another? Is it biased or is it objective? Is the data current? Does it go back two years ago or longer? Is the data even relevant if it's more than a year old? Then there's the idea of coverage. Is there enough, is there enough in-depth coverage of this topic? Does it go into enough detail to make it usable? It's important to keep in mind that as we look at the future of IT and business, information technology is here to help business to be more productive, to be more efficient, and to be safer and more profitable in the future. So let's take a look at some of the future technologies that already exist. And I think about how exactly is information technology going to go that one next step to take what we have already and what we're doing and to enable us to be even more productive. What is going to be that next step? Unfortunately, nobody really knows. It's interesting to see how the technology is improving. And it's important to keep in mind that just because a process is new, it doesn't mean it's innovative. Just because a process or an app or software is new doesn't mean it's going to be going to add any sort of advantage to those that are using it as opposed to those that aren't. So we take a look at the future of IT and business. And it's going to be very interesting to see where we go from here. As we close, if you have any questions about the material or any questions about the chapter, please feel free to touch base with me. Let me know if you have any questions. Thank you.